morning. Uh, my name is Alex. I serve as one of the elders here, and I'm really happy today for the opportunity to share the word with you. This last summer, as happens every four years, we've been able to see all sorts of athletes compete at the Olympics. These people are the best in their field. But as impressive as their skills may be, I find what's far more impressive is their devotion and discipline. These athletes have had a singular purpose, to make it to the Olympics, and they've molded their entire lives around that one goal. They've hired coaches and followed their instruction to the letter for years, all because their goal was that important to them. They chose to guard it from outside influence, to guard against being tempted by the creature comforts of waking up late, snuggling down by the fire on a crisp fall morning with a hot mug of coffee on one hand and a book in the other, they instead imposed on themselves the discipline of setting an alarm before sunrise to train in the cold, damp air. They've purged their houses of sugar, cream, and pumpkin spice to avoid being tempted, choosing instead to stock up on bland protein shakes and eggs and really whatever else high-level athletes eat. All this because they thought that making it to the Olympics was worth it. I wouldn't. Any number of things are more important to me than going to the Olympics. And as much as I admire their dedication, I can't help but think that it seems like an awful lot of effort and sacrifice for such a small reward. In our text in 2 Timothy this morning, you can turn there right now, uh, chapter 1, verses 13 to 18. In our text, we're going to see how Paul is reminding Timothy to have that kind of dedication when it comes to following Jesus, to follow closely the sound teaching that he's received directly from Paul, and to guard the gospel from all those things that would hinder or destroy it. We live about 2,000 years after Paul wrote this letter to Timothy, but as Christians, we're indwelled with the same Holy Spirit that they were. We get to stand on the shoulders of these giants and benefit from the wisdom and truth that the same Holy Spirit that inspired Paul to write is telling us now. Our circumstances may be vastly different, but our goal is the same, to know God's word and to live his ways in the short time that we have on this earth. Because unlike the Olympics, we won't get another shot at it in four years' time. We only get to live once. So please stand with me for the reading of the word. 2 Timothy 1, verses 13 to 18. Hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you've heard from me in the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. Guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. You know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. May the Lord grant mercy to the household of Anisiphorus, because he often ref refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. On the contrary, when he was in Rome, he diligently searched for me and found me. May the Lord grant that he obtained mercy on him in that day. You know very well how much he ministered at Ephesus. Please be seated. I'll pray. Father, I pray that you would guide our hearts by your Holy Spirit as we consider your word this morning. Sharpen our ears that we may hear your voice and challenge us to live in your ways. In the standing of Christ, I pray. Amen. This morning, we're going to be looking at the two commands that we find in our text, to hold on and to guard, and what that means for us in our context today. Starting in verse 13, notice how the first thing that Paul says to Timothy here is to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching. But we're only 13 verses into the letter. So where do we get this pattern of sound teaching? Why does Paul even call it a pattern? I think as has already been mentioned in these past few weeks, chronologically speaking, 2 Timothy is the last letter of Paul in the New Testament. He's imprisoned in Rome and he fully expects to die there. So as he writes these words to Timothy, he's looking back on all the time that they spend together, of all the years and their deep love and affection for one another. As we can see all over this letter, Paul will repeat several times that he longs to see Timothy. He's calling to mind the many conversations that they've had and all the ways in which Timothy has observed him living the life to the glory of Christ, learning not just from his wise words, but also how to live it out practically through his example. You see, before being left by Paul to pastor at Ephesus, Timothy spent considerable time traveling with him, 
So when Paul says, hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that you've heard from me, he's asking Timothy to remember the countless hours of mentoring, of pouring over the scrolls and books of scripture together, of the sermons that he's preached and the letters that he's sent. Notice how Paul qualifies the pattern that he's taught Timothy. It's specifically the pattern of sound teaching in the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Because there are many patterns of teaching that we can hold on to. But unless they're based off the faith and love of Christ, they're worse than useless. They're leading us away from Jesus and further into our own sin. Consider the Olympian weightlifter. If he follows the sound teaching of a good weightlifting coach, he'll get larger and stronger and push himself to new heights in his discipline. But if he follows the marathon running coach, not only is he not going to get any better in his discipline, but he's going to be getting further and further away from his goal. It's the same thing with patterns of teaching that we would find in different churches. If the goal is to grow in the knowledge of Christ and to learn to live his ways, then we need to do what Paul encourages Timothy to do here and to hold on to the sound teaching that promotes godliness. In his first letter to Timothy, Paul was especially concerned with false teachers, those that had been risen up within the church of, at Ephesus. And he counseled Timothy how he should deal with that situation. In fact, the same concern will come later in this letter as well. Such false teachings may sound wise on the surface, and their message may be enticing and encouraging, but their fruit is rotten, causing all sorts of conflict within the church. And rather than leading people to follow Jesus in righteousness, faith, and love, they're turning people toward ungodliness, envy, and faithlessness. In these first few words of our passage, we see how blessed Timothy was to have a mentor like Paul, someone who stood firm in the faith, both in word and deed, and who had, the potential, who had seen the potential in him as a young man and taken him under his wing. Personally, I've been blessed with growing up in a Christian household, where I can say my father is a man who seeks to follow the Lord and who's consistently modeled his faith for us over the years. He isn't perfect. He's not a renowned theologian or a popular preacher. He hasn't written any letters to correct any theology or even been in prison for his faith. But the pattern of his life, which he's passed down to us, my brother, my sister, and I, has consisted of faithful growth, Christian love in action, self-sacrificing availability, and a deep heart of service, wise counsel, and firm rebukes, which I can assure you weren't always well received. I've had the benefit of an earthly father who established this pattern of sound words in the faith and love of Christ, but this isn't true of everyone. In fact, just going by the National Demographic Surveys, it's actually unlikely to be the case for most of us here today. But this is another reason why this particular relationship between Paul and Timothy should inspire those of us who are more mature in the faith to be intentional about pouring into the lives of younger generations. Because though Timothy wasn't Paul's biological child, he still chose to pour into him, to mentor him according to the faith and love that are in Christ, to the point where he grew so close that Paul addresses this letter to Timothy, my dearly loved son. The idea that's sort of being presented here is a little like the old system of mentor and apprentice in the trades, where someone who had mastered a trade takes on an apprentice to pass on his knowledge and techniques. In some cases, the apprentice would even live with the master during his training so that he could benefit from all aspects of the life of the tradesman. Now, you might think that's all well and good, but you're neither a pastor nor an aspiring pastor, this is the second, letter to, the second letter to Timothy that's referred to as a pastoral epistle. So it was clearly written with the intent to help a young pastor to be a good under-shepherd of Jesus. You probably don't see how it can apply to you in, as an individual. But those of us in the business world might have heard of the 10,000-hour rule. And it's a concept that was first presented in a book in which the author had examined what made people successful, from Bill Gates to the Beatles. And he posited that anyone practicing something correctly for more than 10,000 hours will invariably become an expert in that thing. And that makes sense when you think about it. What makes a weightlifter successful? Picking heavy things up and putting them down again, over and over again with the proper technique. What makes a student good at math? Practicing problems and worksheets until it becomes second nature. And this is true of pretty much any skill you can think of. Sure, some people may have a more natural gifting in certain areas, but that doesn't really invalidate the point. 
If we apply this concept observe in human nature to the practice of following Christ, anyone who's been holding on to the pattern of sound teaching that we have in Scripture and the faith and love of, that are in Christ for more than 10,000 hours, about five years, should have grown in the faith such that if someone were to spend time with them, they could clearly see the grace, faith, and love of Christ at work in their lives. Now, including people that deeply in our lives might seem like an impossible task. You know, we're busy. Where would we find the time? We often lack the time to even see our friends and extended family as much as we would like. The lifestyle promoted in our culture is one of extreme personal convenience. It's all about me, with articles, talk shows, podcasts, promoting me time, me-cations, to be myself, put myself first. Some companies even have it as a slogan, because you're worth it. Telecommuting, working from home, has become almost necessary if you want to hire anyone anymore, because it's more convenient than to have to commute. But then we look at scripture and we see a call to the opposite. A call to die to yourself, to know others and be known in a community of believers, and to love others more than yourself. Following Jesus is intensely countercultural. So how did Paul do it? With writing, preaching, church planting, missionary journeys, his time had some significant demands on it. And yet he found the time to invest that significantly in Timothy. Acts 16 describes really quickly how Paul was traveling, visiting churches, he heard good things about Timothy and took him along on his travels. And in much the same way, on a more personal note, I remember more than one occasion where my dad woke up early on his day off because someone at church needed help, usually manual labor or renovations. I even remember being woken up before dawn to rent a truck and drive several hours to help someone we barely knew move when their movers had fallen through at the last minute. That the kind of discipleship is where we say, come see how I live. So why not include people in the mundanity of living gospel-centered lives? If you're busy with the routine of managing kids, dinner, and tantrums, why not invite a younger Christian to join you on a random Tuesday evening to see your everyday walk with the Lord? You're going to change the tires on your car over the weekend? Why not invite a young Christian to help you out? You could even do his tires at the same time. If you're driving to the island of Montreal for work, why not give a ride to a student or three while you're at it? You never know, with the state of our bridge, that might be a productive investment of a significant amount of time. It's incredibly difficult to overestimate the impact that witnessing older Christian walking with the Lord faithfully, even in the most mundane of circumstances, can have on the lives of the young people who look up to him. After all, the Ephesians, in a very direct manner, and the whole Christian church over the past 2,000 years, through the written word, have greatly benefited from one man's pattern of sound teaching given to his protege in the faith and love of Jesus. So if you want to see for yourself some of the specific things that this pattern that Paul is referring to here in verse 13, we can reach back just one page. Do it with me right now. One page. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, see, 1 Timothy is, as the title would suggest, the first letter of Paul to Timothy. It's actually a really simple trick when reading scripture that whenever we have a number before the name of a book, you know right away that you can look at the other books in that series for context or to gain a better understanding of the whole. So in chapter 6, verses 11 and 12, Paul lays out some of what he means when he says, hold on. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, endurance, and gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you have made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. And that's just two verses of an epistle rich in wisdom. And if you keep flipping back, you'll find First and Second Thessalonians, Colossians, Philippians, all of which we know that Timothy was present with Paul at the time of writing. The first commandment in our text in verse 13 is to hold on to the sound pattern of, to the pattern of sound teaching. The second, in the very next verse, is to guard the good deposit. So look at verse 14. Guard the good deposit through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Now this phrase would have sounded very, very familiar to Timothy, as seeing as it was one of the last things that Paul had written in his previous letter. In 1 Timothy 6.20, Timothy, guard what has been entrusted to you. <clears throat> 
And when we look back just a few verses at 11 and 12 that we studied together last week, we'll see the same language used again. For this gospel, I was appointed a herald, apostle, and teacher. And that's why I suffer these things. But I'm not ashamed, because I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to guard what has been entrusted to me until that day. So we see that the very thing that Paul is reminding Timothy to guard is the gospel. And that's also the reason that he's currently suffering. Now, isn't it refreshing how brutally honest Paul is being here? He's not beating around the bush. He isn't trying to sell Timothy on an easy life of health, wealth, and leisure. Instead, he's being crystal clear on the fact that guarding the gospel will mean suffering. The suffering for the gospel has meant different things at different times from the legal persecution and outright execution which Paul himself was facing and which many martyrs over the millennia have faced to being a social outcast, a loss of close family relationships, shunning. There are, certain, sorry, there are even certainly those among us this morning who are struggling with some aspects of that in their daily lives. It may be that people you once called friends have abandoned you, or you're being ridiculed by cherished family members. In his first letter to Timothy, we learned that there are already false teachers at the church of Ephesus, people who are teaching false doctrines and are using the appearance of godliness as a way of, to get material gain. Through their teaching and their actions, they're perverting the gospel, twisting it such that it serves their purpose. But that's no gospel at all. It has been stripped of the power to save. The gospel needs to be guarded because it's the simple truth of salvation. It's the good news that Jesus, God incarnate, died on the cross, the death that we all deserved, and he rose again the third day, having conquered sin and death, and that we're saved by grace because of his great sacrifice when we repent of our sin and place our faith in Christ. Because of this, Paul is reminding Timothy to guard the good deposit that was entrusted to him by following his example and not being ashamed of the gospel, nor of its messenger, rather to share in the suffering for the gospel. If we genuinely have faith in Jesus, then our lives are not our own. We were no longer under the suffering and bondage of sin and shame, but we've been brought to new life in Jesus. The eternity we will spend in his presence is worth immeasurably more than any amount of suffering in the short time we have on earth. Last week, we saw that Jesus himself is guarding the gospel until that final day. And now Paul tells Timothy to participate actively in guarding it as well. Notice, though, how Timothy is able to guard the good deposit. Through the Holy Spirit who lives in us. Paul is clearly intending for this to be comforting news. But there are so many conflicting and mistaken views on the Holy Spirit nowadays that we might be a little confused as to what he's actually saying. So first, let's consider what this Holy Spirit isn't. He isn't the Christian equivalent of the force from Star Wars. Some um, impersonal force without agency, like electricity, that we can use if we just knew how. He isn't some blue genie bound to fulfill our wishes and desires, either. He is God himself. Third member of the Trinity, the one who was prophesied in Ezekiel 36, I will place my spirit within you and cause you to follow my statutes and to carefully observe my ordinances. As we see from our text and from Ezekiel, he indwells the believer. Whenever I think about that, I just can't help but be awed that the God of creation would dwell within me, a sinner. I'm just going to go through a short list that tells us in point form a bit of what the Holy Spirit actually does. He intercedes for us to the Father. He convicts us of sin. He fills the believer with all joy and peace and causes us to abound in hope. He seals us and testifies to our salvation. He sanctifies us. He teaches us and sheds light unto the words of Scripture. So now knowing who it is that is within us, isn't that much more comforting news? not having to do this on our own. God's own Holy Spirit has taken up residency in the believers, and that's the means through which we can accomplish the task of guarding the good deposit, not by our strength, but his own. I've read an article recently that explained the psychological reasons why torture is ineffective. 
It essentially boils down to the fact that after a certain amount of stress or pain or fear, people will just say about anything to make it stop, regardless of whether or not it's true. Which is why the long history of perseverance and even the joy of Christian martyrs facing execution and unspeakable torture is such a great testimony to the power of the Holy Spirit. Not only did they refuse to recant the gospel, but they often went to their death singing hymns to the glory of God. That same Holy Spirit is now at work in us. We'll probably never face the real possibility of prison, torture, or execution for the sake of our faith. And praise God and His grace to us for that. But we will certainly feel the social pressure to conform, to remain quiet about our faith. Times when we don't want to guard the good deposit entrusted to us. It might be when our coworkers are mocking us for our faith, or when a dear family member tells me just how Jesus is just one of many ways to God and that all religions are basically the same. You might ask yourself, is this a moment where I need to hold on to the sound doctrine? Is this where I should guard the good deposit? And since we live in a 21st century individualistic Western culture, we might miss a lot of the context that the author written to writing this to a first century Mediterranean audience would have taken for granted. So I think it's important to note a few things about this first century Roman Empire that will help us get a better understanding of what was meant, what it meant for Paul to be imprisoned, for both him and for his friends. See, in that culture, honor and shame had a huge impact on all social aspects of your life. In some cases, it could even mean the difference between being unemployable and being able to provide for your family. Some things like attaining positions of power and wealth brought honor to you, and that honor sort of splashed on to your friends and family. While other things had that reverse effect, causing dishonor and shame to stick to you and infect the people associated with you. Being imprisoned was one of the most shameful and dishonorable things that could happen to someone, independent of the reason for the imprisonment but it often resulted in them being abandoned by their friends and family. And the prison system wasn't like ours today. The prisoners were reliant on friends and family for clothing, food, and drink. All the necessities. So while having encouraged Timothy to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching and to guard the good deposit, Paul writes about a well-known situation that serves as a counterexample. This is what happens when people don't hold on to the pattern of sound teaching and don't guard the good deposit. Look at verse 15 with me. You know that all those in the province of Asia have deserted me, including Phygelus and Hermogenes. When Paul mentions that he was being deserted by all those in the province of Asia, he's referring to the fact that that shame of being associated with him and the faith was too much for them to bear. They were unwilling to suffer for the sake of the gospel. They were unwilling to guard that good deposit. But did you notice that there are two people mentioned by name here? Phygelus and Hermogenes. And we don't know anything more about these two other than what is written in this one verse. They aren't mentioned anywhere else in scripture, and their names aren't in any way significant enough to have made it to the historical texts. We assume that they would have been well known to Timothy and the Ephesian church, given the context of this letter. But from the moment that Paul wrote this letter until the final day, these two men are going to be known worldwide for nothing else than deserting Paul in the gospel. But then comes Onesimus, who rather than deserting Paul because of his imprisonment, traveled to Rome and sought him out. Now think about that for a second. At the time, the Christians from all over the Roman Empire are being persecuted for the sake of the gospel. The Christians in the city of Rome specifically have been accused by the emperor of, have, of having set fire to the city and are being summarily executed. And the associated dishonor and shame is such that a great many have abandoned the faith. Even Paul, an apostle, church planter, prominent missionary, and Roman citizen is chained up in prison in the capital of the empire because of this gospel which he preaches and which Christians everywhere believe. And rather than laying low, not making waves, waiting for the storm to pass, Onesiphorus heads to Rome and starts drawing attention to himself. 
I know it may sound something like a horror story for some of the younger generation, but bear with me. At the time, there was no internet, no Facebook, Instagram, and not even so much as a phone book in which you could look someone up anonymously. So when Paul says that Onesiphorus diligently searched for him, that means asking questions to real people, face to face. Knowing that he was looking for someone that was imprisoned meant that some of those people were likely of the armed and armored variety. The very people who were responsible for the incarceration of the man he's looking for. The very people who are actively persecuting guys like him, who follow the very teachings for which Paul is imprisoned. That's no small risk that he took. But that's not the extent of it. Look again at verse 16. He often refreshed me. He did it more than once. In these few short sentences, we can see that this was a typical Onesiphorus action. In other words, this was a man who held on to the pattern of sound teaching and who guarded the gospel in such a way that his life had developed that telltale pattern that testifies to the one in whom he placed his faith. Look at verse 18. You know very well how much he ministered at Ephesus. So how are you going to be remembered? Is your name going to join a long list of apostates? People who, if their names are even remembered, are known for one thing and one thing only, being deserters, making a shipwreck of their faith, like Phygelus and Hermogenes? Or will you be known as an Ephesophorus has been, and will be until that final day, a man who is characterized by what it means to hold on to the sound teaching, who is not ashamed to be a follower of Jesus, a man who is ready to suffer for the sake of guarding the gospel, and who's shown repeatedly through a pattern in his own life, both in refreshing and supporting Paul in Rome and in his day-to-day -day life in his local church at Ephesus. What if the cultural tides were to shift drastically and Christians were being arrested and executed here, pastors especially, and because he preached the word without compromise and offended the authorities, Pastor William was arrested and they were actively searching for his co-conspirators. Would you visit him in prison? Would you mark your name on that visitor's ledger and let them take down your information, knowing that it could be the ammunition that they need to come after you and your family? Because that's what Anesiphorus did. So what does it mean for us in the smallish town west of Montreal, 2024, to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching and to guard the good deposit entrusted to us? What does it mean to not be ashamed of the gospel? After all, no one is threatening our families, our lives, or our livelihoods. We don't risk imprisonment for sharing the gospel or associating with those who preach it. And even if we did, our prison conditions are worlds apart from those that there's a first century Rome. And yet, there's still a still social stigma attached to following Jesus, isn't there? When we're chatting about our weekend around the water cooler at work, do we mention going to church? Or do we prefer to gloss over that because it might get an awkward reaction? When a friend goes on and on about the latest self-help book that changed their life, do we mention how profoundly our lives have been transformed by the gospel? You may never have to search for a prisoner in a hostile city, but if you're a student, would you have the courage to ask around and see if there may be a Bible study at your school? And if there isn't, would you dare even start one? What would happen if we did? Would we be called intolerant? Would, we, would people be dismissive, argumentative, possibly even aggressive? Would it affect our chances at a promotion, possibly break our relationship with loved ones or make us into social pariahs? And if you're a guest here this morning with us, and all this talk of suffering for the gospel seems scary and off-putting. After all, you might have expected me to be trying to sell you on all the wonders of being a Christian how it can give you access to the big genie in the sky and solve all your problems and make you healthy and rich. But instead you hear of prisoners and martyrs and being deserted for the sake of the gospel. I'm here to tell you that it's worth it. It's so worth it. Scripture says that on that day, on that final day of judgment, all will be raised from the dead, some to eternal life, others to the disgrace of eternal contempt. To put it into perspective, if I were to give, to say to, I, that I will give you a billion dollars tax-free 
but the catch was that you would have to be zapped by a taser for three solid seconds. Would anyone hesitate? Of course not. What's three seconds of pain to get to spend the rest of your life in luxury? How much more worthwhile is momentary suffering in this life when we consider that eternity hangs in the balance? If you've been saved by grace through faith according to Scripture, then you've been called to follow Jesus, to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that we have in Scripture. As we've seen, this isn't an idle or inactive belief that we can put on a shelf and take out when it's convenient. Rather, it's a faith that will be visible in our actions. So what are you guarding? Are you guarding a temporary life, running after the American dream of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness? Is this short span of time on earth really worth it? Or are you guarding the gospel through the Holy Spirit that lives in you? Is your life one that demonstrates the pattern of sound teaching that we see taught in Scripture? Are you growing in holiness and righteousness and being sanctified day by day? Because sanctification is an instant. It's a process that takes time, and it looks different for each individual because the Holy Spirit who sanctifies isn't some impersonal force. He's God. So consider carefully, what pattern of teaching are you holding on to? What is it that your life is guarding? Let's pray. Father, I pray that you would be glorified in our lives that by your Holy Spirit, you would give us the strength to hold on to the pattern of sound teaching that we have in your word, because we know that we will be tempted to seek teaching that tickles our ears. I pray that when we feel unable to guard the good deposit, your Holy Spirit would give us the strength to stand unashamed, and that he would recall your word to our minds, that he would cause us to boldly walk in your ways so that you may be honored by our perseverance and suffering and that all who watch may bear witness to your greatness. In the great and holy name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.